I'm going to modify the signal 100 megahertz oscilloscope and I'm going to turn it into a 300 megahertz oscilloscope. I'm going to modify it a little bit inside. So if you want to see how I'll do that, stick around. So I've got two scopes here. One's a Siglent SDS-2102, which I purchased about five years ago with a bunch of options. So it's got the MSO options and stuff like that. So it's got logic analyzer function. I've got a little unit I plug into that port just there. And I've got eight channels of logic analyzer, which I've used to repair some fluke multimeters in the past. I think one of my very first videos I ever posted on YouTube was me diagnosing the digital to analog circuitry inside a fluke A842A. I'd actually have to fix that. I fixed a couple of those fluke multimeters. And I've also got the Keysight here, which is quite special to me because I won that from the Keysight Test to Impress contest back in, was it, 2018. I did a little video on that when I received it as well. That was pretty special because Keysight chose my videos as one of the ones they wanted the, the gift on their scopes to. So this is important to me, you know, they're both important to me, scope, because this is really functional and does a lot of stuff. The Keysight doesn't have the MSO options on it, but it's still a nice scope. So I'm kind of, you know, I've got two nice scopes here. I'm quite lucky, really. However, both scopes are only 100 megahertz scopes. Like if you look over here, uh, 100 megahertz, two giga samples, 100 megahertz, two giga samples. All right. I kind of would like a four-channel scope, and also kind of like something with a higher bandwidth. You know, closer to sort of three, 400 megahertz around that kind of region somewhere. It give me a lot more options when I'm trying to do testing and give me much better representation of what's really there when I'm trying to fix test gear. I've been sort of holding out, hoping that one day one of these manufacturers, you know, be it Keysight, Siglent, Roland Swartz, Tektronics, one of them, would maybe send me a, a nice high-end scope. And I came really close to it with um, Roland Swartz. They were going to send me one, but um, they decided that my channel wasn't quite big enough yet, so they held back. So that didn't quite pan out, unfortunately. You know, so it goes. Might be one day. So I'm going to have to get more bandwidth in order to give you some better options. Now I was looking around online, thinking, you know, this is like the 2102. Now this particular model went up to uh, 2302. It was the highest model, right? 300 megahertz. So you know, what's the difference between the 2102 and the 2302? It's probably not much. Usually it's the same hardware with some minor changes. So I haven't investigated the Keysight one yet, but because I found some information on this one. So I thought, right, well, as soon as I found information on it, I might pull the thing apart and have a little poke around. I've never opened this up, never opened up either of these units, they're both still sealed from the factory, so I've never opened them up before. But I want more bandwidth, and I don't want to buy another one. I've got two scopes, so I don't need to buy a third one. Getting one for free from a manufacturer as a, as a demo unit or as a review item to keep would be great. Hint, hint, anyone out there that wants to send me a free scope, please do. So I'm going to pull this thing apart and have a look at the front end and see if I can see anything obvious here. But obviously what I want to do first is hook up some test signals and see what I actually get. I don't do it on one channel, I'm not bother doing both channels, it should basically be identical anyway. OK, I've got this hooked up to my Roland Swartz SMY02 i signal generator because this thing can put out enough power across enough of a frequency range in order to do this testing. Awesome piece of gear this. I'm glad I bought this. I really use it though, this is like the first time I've used it in ages. It's perfect for this sort of thing. Right, so I've got it set at 1 MHz, so you can see at the top corner here it says 1 MHz. And I've got 1 volt here. So my generator's putting out exactly 1 volt. And that's what it's got here. No modulation, obviously. I'm going to do 1 MHz steps. And we're just going to go all the way up and we'll see what it goes to. Right? So you can watch that. You can see the frequency in the corner. You've got 10 MHz and there's a drop there, slightly. Let's keep on going up. I'll just pause occasionally so you can see it. You might have to pause the video and stuff like that, but anyway. So this is rated 100 megahertz, right? So that's 100 megahertz here, and that's 800 millivolts. So it's already dropped down a little bit there. We'll keep going and see what the uh, 3 dB point actually is, because it should be 707, which is what we're looking for here. Still going. So it's already exceeded its spec bandwidth, actually, it's quite good. Yeah, 707's flicking there. 145 megahertz. 144 megahertz. So it's already exceeded its spec, which is 100 megahertz. So that's already pretty good. That's a good sign, isn't it? I should do the same test on the uh, key side, actually. This is using 50 ohm input impedance and stuff as well, so it's all matched properly, like it's supposed to be. And it does actually have switching on the front panel. It does actually switch 50 ohms, it's not just a display thing. So I should do the same thing on the key side and see what that one does. 
Okay, so we've got hooked up to the key side. Now the key side doesn't have 50 ohm input uh, switching, so we have to put a external terminator on this one in order to keep it consistent and to give proper matching. So you can see here, getting one volt here. So again, we'll get that down to 707. And here's the frequency over here, one megahertz. Let's ramp it up. 30 megahertz here, it's not bad. Yep, still doing alright. One hundred megahertz to give an eighty, which is still pretty high. Now this doesn't give me a proper measurement here. I'll tell you what it is when we get down to seven oh seven, and I'll tell you uh, the frequency. Maybe I can do this and get more. Yeah, that's doing it. No. Let's keep going. Gone past it. 707 is around there. Bounce around slightly. So yeah, caught it there. Right, 164 megahertz. So this is also exceeding its spec. So that's pretty impressive. They're both exceeding 100 megahertz spec, which is good to know. But I still want more out of that segment. I still want more. So I don't know if there's a bandwidth modification for the key site. I really don't know. I haven't looked, but I, I did find one for the signal, as I said, so I'm going to play around with that. Right, so I've got no idea how to pull this thing apart yet, we'll have to figure it out as we go along. Anyway, I've not seen these before. That's just on the back of one. So you've got uh, external trigger, pass fail output, um, USB, and LAN port. And obviously Kensington lock as well, multi voltages. Nice decent sized fan. It's not too noisy, this thing's it's you hear it, but it's not that bad. And as you can see, it's still got the original seal on it. Now, because I've had this thing for about you know, five or six years now, I'm pretty sure the warranty's expired. So I'm not too worried about breaking that seal now. <laughs> Alright. Let's get this thing apart. I've already prepared the correct bit. It's a uh, what is it? It's a torque size 10. Someone had one of these, I didn't actually know what it was, because it wasn't marked, but it's a magnetizer, demagnetizer. If you want to magnetize your bit, you just do that. It's not working there. Got that one there. So these are all machine parts. So we've got the three in the back of machine screw. So these are also machine screws, Jeez. so they've got inserts in the casing, that's nice. Right. Look like they're all the same. Let's fish these out, or they'll drop them and lose them or something. Don't want that to happen. What? The last one's not going to drop out, is it? That one there. Ain't coming out in a hurry. Right. Well. There's a couple up here as well. Let's get those out. These are countersinks. So I think I can pull the back panel off. It's probably got clips on it as well. Now, why have I missed any screws? I should always check. Nothing on that label. This is an injection mark, that's the gate. Yeah, 2015, so that's four years old. Here we go. July 2015, it's four years old. Uh, pretty sure I've got all the screws. Pretty sure. Right, it's might just put the label on the bottom then. Let's peel this off. It's gonna use this, I'm not gonna use my usual razor blade technique, it's probably fine for this. Like I'm not too worried by it because it is you know, past its bloody date anyway. I'll just cut it. What the hell? Now, I'm guessing this has got clips. Let's get a spudger. Kind of. It seems to be stuck a bit on the sides here. Let's 
Is it? Hold on a minute. Uh -huh. See this? There's one more. <laughs> no more calibration. And that's a plastic screw. Right. Here we go. Let the feet fall out. What's holding it? Here we go. Oh, there we go. It's coming. It's coming. See inside. So there's the casing. Let me show you these. In case you actually care, you probably don't. Date stamps. So that's also says 2015. And third month, so that's obviously March. March 2015 is when this casing was made. And what is it? Well, that's probably ABS. Now the next thing is how do we get to the front of this? Uh, okay, so we've got some screws here, rivets, memory battery there, that's interesting, the battery ports over here. Maybe I'll just have to take this, this shield here off, it might expose the part of the ball that I need. So if anyone want to replace the fan, you can do, is the plug in there, nice and easy. What is it, 12 volt probably? You get a 12 volt fan, 90 milliamps. Alright, so I think I just need to take these screws out from that part of the casing. I think that might be all I have to do. Let's give it a go. Start the same screws. Yes, it is. Okay, some bug fan. It's got a cable tie in here. So I might just cut that for you and afterwards. It's not exactly much as it's a cable tie. So there we go. Right, we get in there. So, this is what the inside of one of these looks like. As you can now see, it's got space for four channels on the board. So all these are in the same board, which means the component layout will be the same as the four channel. Excellent. Now I already see from this layer here, I'll point to it with this. This chip here and this chip here are the ones which are of interest. Now the part is at the end of that chip, which is right there. This gets closer. Okay, I'll show you on the actual can in a minute. I'm going to show you on this piece, but it doesn't matter. So that is where the capacitor is supposed to be there. And there. Right adjacent to that chip. That moves on, on between the two channels, but these two channels are like a mirror of these. They're exactly the same, or a duplicate of those. So you get those two and put them here in the same. According to the pictures I've seen online, I've never seen inside one of these before. We'll have a close look at it, shall we? So... A ribbon going to the front panel, some memory. Obviously, it's got a separate memory and control or anything on this side. There's also an interface here, some FPGA or something here to do with the controls, and it's also duplicated. So, you've got memory chips there too. So, it's basically this duplicated over here. So, it's the same board, that's a nice thing to know. I really don't know much about the architecture, so let's, let's pop this out. I'll pop the casing off. Oh, that's on there pretty tight. Here we go. All right. And there we are. Here's the inside. So as I said before, what we're looking for here is that capacitor there and that capacitor there. Right now it's going to be footage of the EV block form showing a modification because that's where I found the information. Right, so this is what I found as far as modifications go to expand the bandwidth on this scope. Now it's supposed to be for like 1000x, 2000x, but apparently it's like the same boards and it does look exactly the same from what I can see from those pictures that are in here versus what I've just found. So it does look the same, so it's looking like it's very possible. Here's some pictures of the 2304x, and as you can see here, that looks very, very similar. See, there's no capacitor in that point there. Alright, so that is the finding from other people. 
the, in, the inside there looks very similar. It's slightly different, but it, you know, this relay here is orientated slightly differently. You cut a little bit like that, but it is otherwise the same. This is the 1000, 2000, apparently. It's 2000, STX 1000, STX 2000. Right? Well, STS. So you can see this is different configurations, but the 2000 is the same as those ones there. And other people have done similar stuff. We'll give it a go. We've already got a before benchmark. We know what we're getting before. We'll do the same thing again. Take those out. Okay, so I'm going to start by putting some uh, leaded solder on these parts. And we'll see how we go if I'm going to just use this iron. I don't know. Um, I might have to use hot air. I prefer to use something more precise you know, as an iron. I don't have a tweezer iron, which is a bit of a shame. If somebody wants to send me one to review and keep, that'd be great. It has to be a decent quality one. I've got a, well, I do have an iron, but it's not good enough for this kind of size part. That might even work like that, actually. I'll do the same on this one. So this boy, going side to side, that's not doing the job, unfortunately. So I might have to use hot air. But at least it'll be easier to melt now, I've got some lead free solder on there. So I've got the heat on my iron, or my hot air set at 380. Is that one? The same on this one. Set one. So they're out. Just get my iron, just give it a bit of clean. Just get any remaining solder off those pads. In case there's any bridges or anything. Looking pretty good though. Right. In theory, that's it. There's a little bit of flux here. I might just give that bit of a swab. Also, I don't want to leave any residue in there because it might affect it. So let's just get a cotton bud and a bit of IPA. Don't leave any residue behind if I can. It's looking better. Let's do the other one. Alright, that doesn't look too bad. It works. This one looks a bit worse on camera than reality, I think there is. No, it's all gone. Yeah, it's all gone. That's right. So I'm happy with that. Now we'll put it back together. Whitney recalibrating? Yeah, possibly. I don't know. Maybe it does. Let's try and get the cover on first before we worry about anything else. Okay, that's. I think that's all the way down. Yep. Okay. So this is the like, perfect time to replace this fan with a quieter one.
I mean, fan isn't too noisy, but it could be better. Should I power it up and show you before I put the back cover back on? Probably should do, eh? We'll just look at it. Normally I'll say don't put screws up all the way up to full tightness until you actually get them all in. But these are self uh, countersink screws, so they're actually self-aligning. You tighten one up, obviously it pushes the rest to be in alignment, as long as it's designed right. Let's plug this power supply in. Now we'll listen to this fan, and we'll try and decide if we're going to bother changing it or not. If I plug the fan in, that will be good. I mean, that isn't rubber mounting as well, that's on rubber. I'm pushing buttons because I've got the thing laying down. It's not that noisy. I think I'll leave it alone. Let's put it back together. See if I can forget any screws. Does that really need cable tying, you think? And it's sitting out of the way. I don't think it's really going to be rubbing or moving around anyway. I don't really think it's necessary. It's not really like it's under any vibration stress. The feet back in, otherwise you'll forget about them and that'll be annoying. Okay. It's all good. We'll put the self-tapping screw in first, which is interesting. Anyway. I'll do the rest. The thing with this particular screwdriver is it doesn't have like a torque setting, so I can't reduce the torque on it. It's a bit annoying. So I've got to try and stop it as quickly as I can, as soon as I notice it's getting towards the end of the thread. Otherwise you risk stripping stuff out. Also I get those caps and um, test them. If I haven't lost them already, I know I can see them. They're just very small. I don't know, like O2 ones or something like that. Right, so here's the caps, let's measure them. Let's see what we get. So this is the one that's in channel 2. No reading, that's interesting. Okay, let's check the one that's in channel 1. If I can get hold of it. 8.8 PF. So that's strange. I've just changed this to be automatic ranging instead of just capacitance ranges. And um, it thinks it's a 0.7 ohm or 0.07 ohm resistor. Oh, 0.15 ohm resistor at 10 kilohertz. Increase the frequency gives me different resolutions. 8.81 pf at 10 kilohertz. 8.86 at 100 kilohertz. Let's try to scope out and see what happens. Okay, let's check this out again. I've, I've already had a bit of a play around just to make sure it worked before I recorded. It does work. Now I need to demonstrate it. So I'll just put up the all measure instead this time. So over here we've got. Oh, I missed. There we go. Right there. Third one down over there. 1.01. .01, okay. This is at 1 megahertz. Is it? 6 megahertz. There we go. 1 megahertz is there. Let's bring this down a bit more. Here we go. 1 volt. 1 megahertz. Let's wind up and see what we get. This is on channel 1, and I'll do channel 2 afterwards. Well, by about, I think it was about 6... 61 megahertz, I think it was. The RMS was down to about 880 or something. I think it worked out as. So it's already further than it was before. It's already flatter. So that's a good sign. On a megahertz. That's good. That's definitely a lot better. 
it's about 100 millivolts more something like that. Let's keep going up. So our previous limit was about 145, so we're still above that. Keep going. 200 megahertz. Let's just change this a little bit. Keep it so it looks reasonable. So 200 megahertz, we got 890 there. Still great. Keep going. Still going. So, 300 megahertz, 770. So it's exceeding 300 megahertz. Excellent. Keep going. Oh, we're near there. Is that it? One more? About there? Yeah, we caught it there, I think. It's bouncing 22. 345 megahertz. That's much better. 345. Excellent. Thank you, EV Blog Forum. <laughs> I guess I can stop holding up now for a free scope from somebody else. Let's try the next channel. Let's wind it back down again. Back down to 1 megahertz. And we'll change channels. I need to change the triggering and stuff as well. And channel 2 on. Channel 1 off. Channel 2. Measurement. Channel 2. Yep. Uh, triggering, I want obviously to be on the correct place, so I need to set up the trigger to be on channel 2. Right, here we go. So, kind of getting 975 there. Shoot my lead, make sure it's done up properly. Yep, so it's sitting slightly low on channel 2. Maybe channel 2 is calibrating, I don't know. We wind it up. Okay, still there. Increase this a bit. So 89 megahertz there. So we got to 100. Oh, a bit past it. All right, so 100 megahertz is about 956. It's like barely dropped at all. It's pretty flat. It's pretty good. Keep going. And keep on going. Well, 235 megahertz is still barely dropped. This is actually really flat. Okay. Now it's starting to drop. So it's still like 300 megahertz is starting to drop there, really. So let's get for 707 again. Yeah, we'll call it there, shall we? That's 347 megahertz. So basically, you've got an excess of 300 megahertz bandwidth on both channels now. Woohoo! I'm happy. Now you know how to do this particular scope mod. So it's documented online, which is how I found it, but now you've actually seen it done. Maybe you'd be even more willing to try it if you've got one of these scopes and you want to give it a bit more life before you have to replace it. Or if you're like me and you're a YouTuber, you're kind of tired of hanging out for manufacturers to give you a free one. <laughs> Make sure you subscribe, click the bell icon, give us a thumbs up, and get to later. So as you can see, I've got two signal scopes here. Well, that's a bit of a cock up, isn't it? No, I've only got one signal scope. That's a nice outtake.